1985, prior to Kuyobai reaching Monrovia, <clears throat> a young man by the name of Emmanuel Dennis, who was also a military man, very close to uh, Kuyobai, had approached me because he knew what I'm telling you now. He was a very good friend of mine, brother-in-law. So he approached me and talked to me about the situation. The same lecture that I'm giving, the same lecture I'm giving, my friend, people are not serious to do anything in this country. We cannot continue to go out there and kill our people when there is no set agenda. There's nothing that's going to be successful to move our country forward. I refuse to do that. When Kuyongba entered this country, some brothers went to pick me up <clears throat> because their understanding was that those who were in the country who were already trained, who understood military uh, uh, science or whatever you call it, had to take part because by then the amount of people that were coming with the Quilpa group would not have been enough. So all we had to do, get in our positions and do what we had to do. This is the first place I got discouraged. When the, the guys came to my house, I told them I was taking my girlfriend home and I was going to meet with them later on. So they said, we'll come back in a few minutes. They're driving around with beer in their hands, you know, drinking and stuff like that. That was one sign that this is not serious. The most important thing that changed my mind in 1985 was when I went by Ambassador Durin's house, they arrested him. Just when I was, I was passing through, they were putting him in the car. And he was the one driving the car. Then I told my girlfriend, the coup has failed. She said, what happened? I said, there's no way you see the arrest of government official in a military coup d'etat and he drives, even in real life, in the paramilitary, in the police. How can you arrest someone and ask the person to drive the car for you? Anything can go wrong. I said, that's a sign. That's it. I'm not going anywhere. Well, people in the yard play music, Sonia Kuzo who owns the land, all the kind of good stuff. Right in that very yard, there was another small yard uh, where we had uh, Gil people. Well, crown people were living there on the other side, and Gil people on the other side. And the window of my girlfriend's home was facing the Gil people home and community. When everything changed around, when everything changed around, I was sitting right there, looking through the window when they were collecting people, killing them, throwing them in the truck. By the time they got done, that whole particular area was empty. I know some ran away, but I know they got a lot of them in the truck. I watched that whole episode. Then, it was live on TV. At the time, it was live on TV until a little before it got cut off. I was watching the TV. People were running from Gunnersville, going all the way free for coming to town to celebrate. By the time they got to they got to uh, Freeport. The news changed. They could not run back. Bullets, people died. You know, I don't know how many people, but people died. It was live on TV, and I saw that. In front of the executive mansion, those who were passing by there, people died. We saw that on TV. So later on, my girlfriend looked at me and said, you know something? I think you know something that people don't know in this country. I said, no. I just know as much as you know. The thing is, you must understand, if something is going to go wrong, you can see how it's going to go wrong. And you must be able to be, to stay in a position where you make a decision that's going to be in your best interest and the interest of your family. So I protected my, fam my family in that direction. They could turn around. I used to work at the top of my law firm. I couldn't go to work for about two weeks. I didn't go to work. Now, the signals that come forth to let you know the direction of the country, some of them came from Abaport. I've never seen Abaport in my whole life. I heard of him. The day I met Abaport, I think this message, he wants me to give it to you. This is what Abaport said. I used to work at the Tottenham Law Firm at the Pan-African Plaza. And this man came walking in the front door, walking fast, a short man, bent over. And then I was standing right there, he asked me, where is Winston Tubman's office? I said, upstairs. He said, take me there now. So I started, you know, I complied. He said, he started saying, I, 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 I'm, I'm a mad young man. I, I, I'm, I'm a mad young man. And I'm like, 
He's not a young man. How can he be mad? Uh, be a mad young man? But then it started clicking my mind. Something made him mad. But he didn't tell me until we got on the elevator. And then he asked me. He said, "You know what happened to me?" I said, "No, sir." He said, "The president slapped me." I said, "Who president?" He said, "Simon Dole." So I said, "What happened?" He said, "I'm the chairman of the board of directors of the Observer." And something was happening in the Observer office. He went there. I think the president got there. Whatever happened, I don't know what was the problem. And at that time, he said the president slapped him. And he asked the president, "Why you slap him, Mr. President?" And he said, the president told him, he asked that question again, I'll kill you. He said, he asked that question again. And the president slapped him the second time. And he was trembling when he explained the story to me. And uh, I said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. But I will take you to uh, Ambassador Tubman's office. And I took him there. When he got in there, he started explaining the same story to Ambassador Tubman. And I was outside waiting. I said, if this is the hour port man I've heard about, I want to talk with him again. I waited for him when he came back outside. I escorted the man out of the building. When we got on the, uh, on the boulevard, on the side wall, he turned towards me and said, son, he said, I've done my part. He said, the rest is up to you guys. You're the young ones. You have to fight for this country. This is a great country. Do all that you can to make it better for you and for your children. And he looked at me, he smiled, Put his hand on my shoulder and he crossed the street. He left. That was another sign where this country was heading. Two weeks later, I think two or three weeks later, here comes another man coming to Winston's office. And I was always at the point where history would be made. This man came out and said, Where is Winston Tubman's office? The same question uh, Mr. Port asked me. I said, upstairs. He said, carry me there. Now, he was not angry or he was not mad as Mr. Port was. But he was nervous and scared. And we got an elevator, went upstairs on the third floor. And then he started telling me his story. I said, well, oh man, what happened? He said, the thing that happened, I never see it before. The thing that happened, I never see it before. So I said, what happened? He said, I've been working in a mansion. I work with President Tubman. I work with President Tubman. I work with President Doe. In a yard, they're cutting people here off. And the blood shooting, the people drinking blood. I said, what? He said, I mean, he was scared. You know, I myself couldn't believe it, that it was true. But that's what he said, it was true. He walked in the office, met with Winston, spoke with Winston. He came back outside. Like I did with uh, Mr. Port. I was trying to escort the, young, the, the old man on the road. And he moved like a black meteor. He moved like a black meteor. You know. He moved like a black meteor so fast that I couldn't even catch up with him. But he left and that was the last time I seen him. I never seen that man again. I don't know anything about him, whether he's still living or not, I have no idea. Mr. Chairman, they are in, before God destroy a country. Before God destroys a country, he sends messages. He sends signals. It is the failure of the people that receive those messages that to, to act as God want them to. That put us in the condition we're in. All of these messages, I have passed them over to people who are movers and shakers in this country to let them know what was happening. Because if we did not take note of these things and act appropriately, tomorrow there will be no Liberia.